we put our own little twist on a lysimetry approach that wasn't new. Uh, that had been around for a long time, that approach. Uh, but what was new was uh, sort of the, the combination of using some sensors uh, and adjusting the soil matrix potential to get the right uh, soil moisture gradient uh, through the soil. And, uh, you know, this had, was a, a really uh, useful advancement uh, because we were able to measure drainage uh, in situ uh, really no better than anybody could do at the time. Then we had a high quality soil water sample that allowed us to do all sorts of solute transport stuff. Welcome to the Crop Science Podcast. I'm your host, Leo Bastos, Assistant Professor in Integrative Precision Agriculture at the University of Georgia. Today, we welcome our guest, Dr. Chris Bright. He's a University Professor of Applied Soil Physics and Pedology at the University of Arkansas. Chris, welcome to the Crop Science Podcast. Thank you so much, Leo. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, we're really excited to have you here today and hear what you what you have to, to tell us about your research interests and um, what you've been doing um, lately in your in your program. So to get us started here, uh, could you share with us and the audience a little bit about your background and your path to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess uh, the the path to where I'm at now at the University of Arkansas really started a long, long time ago. My father grew up on a farm in west central Wisconsin, and uh, he, he was uh, a corn seed dealer uh, for many, many years when I was growing up. And I got to travel around, learn about agriculture, uh, seeing the landscape uh, with him, spent a lot of time on the farm. And uh, when I was finally able to read, <laughs> uh, I learned that uh, there is a Wisconsin, um, I'm originally from southern Wisconsin, west side of Madison, uh, and the farm was in west central Wisconsin, uh, about two hours from where I grew up. And, and when I could uh, finally read, I realized that there was a, a Wisconsin state historical marker that commemorated the Coon Creek watershed uh, project that happened back in the mid-1930s. Uh, it was for soil erosion control. And this state, Wisconsin State Highway historical marker uh, was uh, on the property of my grandparents' farm where my dad grew up. And so it's really serendipitous that uh, uh, I even moved in the direction of agriculture and soil science. And I'm really proud. And that's why I wanted to mention that, uh, that my family's heritage had a lot to do with uh, soil conservation, uh, erosion control, you know, w protecting the Mississippi River water quality uh, going back to the 1930s. And so that's, uh, you know, without knowing it, uh, I, I feel a little bit of, of destiny uh, that was at play. Um, so I have an undergraduate degree in soil science from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. And uh, so soil science was my major. I, I figured it would be something that uh, you know, I knew a little bit about uh, from an agricultural standpoint, the, the importance, uh, the, the historical importance about soil erosion was definitely something I knew about, you know, but just peripherally, uh, just uh, uh, knew a little bit about it. And I figured, you know, it's something that I had an interest in and, and probably take a long time to really saturate my knowledge. And to be perfectly honest, 30 years later, 35 years later, that's has actually been the case. I learn new stuff almost on a daily basis, uh, and, and that's really uh, come to fruition. So, you know, I liked being a student, uh, didn't uh, want to necessarily sever ties from that. So I thought graduate school is really the next uh, step for me. I, I was very fortunate to, to get hooked up with uh, several folks at the University of Wisconsin, John Norman, uh, who is a soil physicist and environmental biophysicist, uh, was the one that uh, offered me an opportunity to uh, work on a research project that um, that he 
And uh, Dr. Larry Bundy, uh, at the time, uh, soil extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin, did a lot with nutrient management, particularly nitrogen in corn. And strangely enough, a forest ecologist was the third faculty member kind of of this research team. And and they uh, they thought I was going to be a good fit for the research project uh, dealing with carbon and nitrogen cycling in corn agroecosystems. Uh, and but also compared to a prairie restoration, uh, all in the similar area, so under the same climate, really the same soils, uh, but different management. Uh, I agreed, uh, happily accepted that. Uh, I moved back home, uh, having been from the west side of Wisconsin, um, west side of Madison. Uh, that was home to me. Uh, the large campus wasn't intimidating. I, I, I knew my way around, so hit the ground running. I was tasked with. Uh, working on an innovative uh, procedure to measure water movement through an undisturbed soil profile. So it really was a soil physics question. And uh, we put our own little twist on a lysimetry approach that wasn't new, uh, that had been around for a long time, that approach. Uh, but what was new was uh, sort of the, the combination of using some sensors, uh, and adjusting the soil matrix potential to get the right uh, soil moisture gradient uh, through the soil. And, uh, you know, this had, was a, a really uh, useful advancement uh, because we were able to measure drainage uh, in situ uh, really no better than anybody could do at the time. Then we had a high quality soil water sample that allowed us to do all sorts of solute transport stuff. And and that's kind of what I ended up doing for my dissertation research. We, we characterize nitrogen and carbon losses, focusing on uh, leaching losses from these different five different ecosystems that I worked in. Uh, so that really gave me a lot of diverse experiences. I was in the lab. I was out in the field. It kept me really close to uh, my soil's interest. Uh, we did some stuff from a, a pedology standpoint. Well, I did while I was in graduate school. And and uh, then everybody wants a job after school, right? And so when, when the school route uh, is coming to an end, uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, I stayed on as a postdoc for a little over a year uh, at the University of Wisconsin, tidied up some publications and then had the opportunity to come to Arkansas. And so I've been here since June of 2001. Uh, so nearly 23 years uh, into it, and uh, I was hired as an applied soil physicist. Uh, we had a pedologist in the department at the time, and uh, when he retired, you know, I had been doing pedology-related research, not a lot, uh, doing some septic system uh, research. So I, I, I very easily took on the role as pedologist as well. I teach classes in soil physics uh, and uh, soil classification and genesis. So research and teaching both of those areas. And uh, that's kind of brought me to, to where I'm at now. I, like I said, I, I teach a graduate level class in soil physics. I teach a graduate level class in scientific presentations uh, for graduate students learning how to uh, mostly speak, uh, but we also do a little bit of writing about uh, their research uh, early on in their careers, because not everybody gets scientific writing experience, you know, has an opportunity to, to hone those skills mm -hmm. for graduate school. Uh, let's see, I teach, uh, it's a combined uh, upper level, undergraduate, graduate level, soil classification and genesis course. I teach soil and water conservation. Uh, and uh, upon arriving at the University of Arkansas, I uh, was trying to investigate, you know, what, what can be my my particular teaching niche. Well, we had soils faculty in the department, so uh, I knew what areas that I was told I have to teach in. Mm -hmm. uh, but what else could I figure out that was really going to be my own stamp on things? And, and come to find out, uh, we had, uh, uh, still do, an environmental soil and water science undergraduate major. Uh, so water science was a part of that. Uh, we've got a geosciences and a biology department on campus here. And even in my own department, we had a, a water scientist. But no one had taught a class in uh, introductory water science. That was going to be my niche. So I developed an introduction to water science class. I've, I've probably taught it nearly 15 times uh, since I've started now, actually teaching it currently this semester. And that's really been uh, uh, one of my niches. I had a really good experience 
with an instructor at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, and I modeled a lot of uh, my class, uh, the subject matter, uh, after the class I took as a student myself. And so I get to see all of the students. It's a required class for our major, and I get to see all the students that come through it eventually, and that's helped uh, populate student hourlies with my research graduate students every now and again, because I see them for a whole semester. I learn about their writing skills, uh, their academics. And so early on, I did a lot of uh, continued research that I did in graduate school. We did solute transport stuff, uh, poultry litter. Uh, Northwest Arkansas is a, a, a large poultry producing region and uh, having uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, manure management, uh, land application of poultry litter, and potential water quality issues, so both from a runoff standpoint and uh, leaching through the soil profile. Mm -hmm. uh, coupled with that land use and, and that industry, we also have uh, karst topography uh, in the Ozark Highlands here around Fayetteville, Arkansas. So we've got really sensitive uh, shallow groundwaters, fractured bedrocks where there is quick transport from the surface uh, to uh, local groundwater. So that's an even uh, meaning that groundwater quality was even uh, more of an issue and uh, got to go through the soil zone, the Vado zone uh, from the surface to groundwater. So that's kind of what uh, led, uh, you know, about the first 10, 12, 15 years of, of my research uh, here was main focused on um, nutrients, uh, heavy metals uh, that were contained in poultry litter when they're land applied and, and really trying to do a mass balance. We measured runoff, we measured drainage through the soil profile and leaching, we measured plant uptake uh, over the course of the growing season, really continuous uh, over time. Uh, and then, so we kind of answered a lot of questions there, we had a lot of students cycle through uh, that project, uh, a lot of publications, and and then I was looking for that next uh, next angle to pursue, and uh, Arkansas is big uh, with rice production. Uh, Arkansas is the number one rice producing state in the United States, and um, uh, so um, thought maybe I, I probably better start dabbling in uh, doing something with rice. And uh, no one in the state had been doing uh, trace gas emissions. Uh, and methane uh, was a main greenhouse gas produced from flood irrigated rice. You know, when flood waters are applied for three, three and a half, four months out of the year, uh, that produces a, a, a pretty quickly, within a couple of weeks, anaerobic reducing, reducing conditions. And uh, so methane emissions is something we started to tackle uh, back in the early 2010s. Uh, we had a couple of students right away help hone uh, a, a static chamber procedure that we adopted from others that had worked in upland crops. Uh, but now we've got a flood water to have to deal with. And, and so methodologically, we had to work out some of the kinks so we could syringe sample uh, from a closed chamber periodically over an hour, transport them back to my lab and, and do the gas analyses on a GC. So uh, there's a whole bunch of different factors that affect methane emissions, and, and we kind of piecemeal uh, worked on those from year to year. Soil texture. Turns out clay soils, the methane emissions are, are almost nothing. Uh, uh, coarser textured soils, silt loams, which were really the dominant soil textures that rice was produced in Arkansas, you know, that's a bigger problem. Um, so uh, significantly greater methane emissions, uh, different uh, types of rice uh, cultivars, hybrids versus pure lines affect methane emissions. Previous crop and, and sort of cropping pattern uh, was uh, soybeans, the previous crop, uh, moving into rice the following year. That's a typical rotation. Soybean rice, uh, and then sometimes it's continuous rice. So whether the previous crop was soybeans or rice played a big role. We studied that. Uh, we studied soil texture. We studied different fertilizer nutrient inputs. Um, Turns out that uh, the the big supply of broiler litter, poultry litter we have in northwest Arkansas, not a really good nutrient source if you want to minimize trace gas emissions. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there are other uh, inorganic uh, fertilizer nutrient sources, particularly for nitrogen, better off as a mitigation strategy. Um, tillage uh, is a is a big factor. Water management, of course, is a big factor. There's some variations on flood irrigation for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we really tackled a, a lot of those 
um, factors that uh, we now know significantly affect methane emissions, maybe our mitigation strategies. But Arkansas also has been developing a water quantity issue. Uh, groundwater is is the typical source of some surface waters, but mainly groundwater uh, is the source of crop irrigation uh, in our eastern third of the state, what we call the Delta. Uh, and um, we're running out of it. And so uh, rice producers, um, I don't know, 10 years ago or so started to dabble in, well, what can we do instead of flood irrigate? Uh, and conserve some water. So they started moving off to this furrow irrigated management practice, which is really similar to some of the upland crops. Uh, but that's taken some time to, to tweak management of rice, uh, you know, as a semi-aquatic plant. Rice likes a lot of water. And when it doesn't have a lot of water, we've got to figure out how to optimize uh, production. That easily minimized uh, methane emissions. But now we're talking about greater CO2 and nitrous oxide emissions really uh, jump onto the radar pretty heavily. So uh, we've been doing uh, trace gas emissions, measuring uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide simultaneously for about the last uh, four or five years in furrow irrigated rice. Again, we're kind of looking at some of the different management practice effects on gas emissions in this different production system. We don't have all the answers yet, but uh, uh, we're working our way uh, through it slowly but surely. Um, the newest twist to my research program is going to kind of take a, a little bit of a right turn. We're still going to do trace gas emissions, but uh, from some recent success with uh, some uh, USDA uh, grant proposals uh, to deal with uh, climate smart agricultural practices. We're going to move away from rice and, and work in upland crops here in, in the near future. So corn, soybeans, corn, soybean rotation, cotton will probably find its way into the mix here uh, in, in the near future. Uh, so we can identify what climate smart agricultural conservation practices can we impose that can minimize, uh, can reduce uh, trace gas emissions, global warming potential on an annual basis compared to like traditional management practices. So uh, that kind of spans um, uh, almost the entirety of, of my age and, and certainly my uh, education and, and professional experience. I've done other things um, but greenhouse gas emissions has kind of been a dominant uh, feature of the last decade and a half of, uh, of my research career here in Arkansas. Well, th this is fantastic. And, and I, I really appreciated you telling the, you know, the, I guess the, the beginning of the, of the story as far as your background and how, how that really connected throughout your career of, you know, the experiences you had growing up and where your farm, your family farm was located and the issues that you you saw there, and how that translate into your interests um, as going through you know academia, going through college, and then grad school, and then becoming a professor. That's really it's really fantastic and really nice, I guess, to see when those things connect so well. Well, it's it's a unique start. Uh, one I never realized early on the prominence. Uh, of what that meant. Um, I use that. I, I teach about, I, not a lot. I get on my little soapbox and give a little blurb about my personal connection to, to some of these uh, issues that we're still dealing with uh, from a management standpoint uh, these days. Soil erosion is not going away. Uh, water quality will continue to be an issue uh, and agriculture is right in the middle of, of all of that. Um, so I do have a personal connection that's provided a lot of motivation for me uh, to, to, while I was a student to kind of absorb as much as I can, uh, to really get into research and try to be able to give back, uh, and, and do something that's meaningful. Uh, and then now on the other side, you know, teaching students the, the value of, uh, conservation practices, where did, where did they come from? Because I actually know they came from, uh, demonstration projects that happened on my grandparents' farm. Uh, they're black and white pictures that I can find in publications uh, that I can picture myself as the photographer because I know exactly what uh, square foot of, of field someone was standing in because I've stood in those fields uh, before uh, myself. So uh, that's been a, a really unique history to me. And, and like I said, a, a driving, motivating factor for me to uh, 
do what I can and um, from a research standpoint, and um, uh, I'm proud of it. That's fantastic. And, and it's really, it's, it's, it's such a key experience yet so unique, right? Because I mean, I don't, I can't imagine that too many people have this close of a connection between an issue and a solution that was developed right there where, where they're coming from and be able to expand and see that develop uh, in their career. So that's, that's really fantastic. Yeah. You know, so you, you, you touch on so many interesting points and, one of them that I just want to make a very quick parenthesis here is when you talk about, you know, when you join um, the university as an undergrad and learning about soils and all the complexities that, you know, I, I could I could totally um, empathize with that, you know, as, as when I was starting in, in my undergrad as well, just like all of this, all of these different subjects that you learn in, about soils when you go to university, but at least I had never heard of, about that before. I was completely unaware of all the complexities that were going on right below my feet. And then when you get into that environment, you start learning about it. It's, it's fantastic. And, and, and I also developed a, a passion for soil science because of that. So it's really, it's really nice to hear you you're sharing that as well. Well, I, I developed, I, I was without knowing it, I wouldn't say forced. Uh, I, I took advantage of the opportunities. Uh, uh, both of my parents grew up on farms, uh, both dairy farms, both in West uh, Central Wisconsin. I got to spend a lot of time on one of the farms and, uh, you know, digging around in the garden. Um, my father, uh, my grandmother, uh, my uncle, you know, every year, big garden, uh, grew a lot of stuff. I helped a lot. Uh, they rented out the land. Uh, they didn't farm it. Uh, by the time I came around, it was rented out. It wasn't an active farm, uh, that way, but you know, I, I got a little bit more of the personal connection to things. I got to walk around the hillsides. I got to see, uh, the remnants of old gullies, uh, and what they've done to, uh, to sort of rectify that these days. I got to fish in, uh, some of the tributaries, uh, that are contributing uh, water to the Mississippi River. And so I got to do those things. And, and I, I did, before going to school, a college that is, um, I did have a, a greater connection to some of that stuff that I could visualize. I had hands on, I had feet on the ground. Uh, and then what it did was just open the door when, when we get into the, a classroom, the academics, uh, start reading about uh, stuff in, in books man, that really just sort of closed the circle for me and, and got really motivated about it. And, and that's, that's kind of been the drive ever since, uh, for sure. Absolutely. No, that's, that's, that's really, it's really nice to, to hear that story. Um, so I, you know, one thing that I wanted to, to follow up as well is, you know, especially, I mean, if, if, if a person has not been around rice production, they may not even understand the differences and complexities that that system has compared to you know, growing corn or soybeans or wheat or cotton, peanuts, whatever else is not rice, especially flooded rice. And of course, that, that has differences. Perhaps the most, the, the largest one would be that one related to, to flooding it and, and having that water water layer on the soil uh, for for a long period of time and you know and how that also impacts nutrient management and and greenhouse gas emissions um, so I guess you know you, you you briefly talked about some of this so talking about methane emissions in rice production um, and perhaps most of the time we're more thinking about carbon sequestration or maybe you know nitrous oxide emissions from uh, fertilized fields and in this case specifically of rice production, methane is such an important one as part of that picture. So in this overall overall picture of greenhouse gas emissions in rice specifically, um, and then also thinking about carbon sequestration. So now not only what's being emitted as a gas, but also what's being potentially sequestered in the soil uh, as, as carbon being sequestered there. Could you just tell us a little bit about that that trade-off, I guess, and that balance between being able to sequester carbon in rice systems, but also all the potential for greenhouse gas emissions that are specific to that system when compared to others. 
Yeah, certainly. So uh, one of these, uh, it, it's sort of been an underlying uh, interest of mine going way back to graduate school because soil carbon sequestration was something that uh, it wasn't the direct uh, research objective of my uh, graduate school research, but that was sort of a secondary objective. We had a prairie restoration, sort of an undisturbed uh, setting. We had uh, several agro ecosystems, uh, one tilled, one no tillage. So I got to learn right away just how important soil disturbance was uh, to sequester carbon. Conservation practices, uh, you know, growing up in the upper Midwest, I mean, that's where they were developed. That that was sort of the epicenter of reduced tillage, uh, contour strip cropping, some of those things. Uh, and then moving to the south, um, uh, it, it's a quite of a different, you know, I could handle the cultural change, but learning really new agricultural philosophies and the scale of agriculture was ac is actually really different from what I was used to in the upper Midwest uh, down here in Arkansas. Um, but learning about rice, I, I could remember going to the grocery store and buying Riceland rice. I, I knew it came in a little blue uh, plastic package. Well, that's the main uh, the main uh, integrator uh, for rice production in Arkansas. Uh, there's a few others now. And so uh, I was eating Arkansas grown rice growing up in, in southern Wisconsin. And so uh, I, I had that little connection. But yeah, learning about the, the agronomics that go into rice production was absolutely fascinating. So you think about soil disturbance first, kind of chronologically, I, I, I didn't realize that rice producers uh, would almost powderize soil. Think about pedologically, you, you want soil that's well aggregated. So there's good gas exchange and water exchange and, and a nice uh, growing environment for plants. Well, you powderize the soil, you almost get rid of the structure altogether, but, you know, that was a necessity to hold the flood water on. You don't want water draining uh, through into and through the soil profile. And so multiple, I'm not talking one or two, I'm talking eight, nine, ten passes across the same piece of ground with a tillage implement, uh, which then created a nice compacted hard pan. And we basically have a, a the I'll, I'll oversimplify this, but the entire delta, eastern third of eastern Arkansas, has got a four-inch plow layer, uh, and it's darn near impenetrable to many upland crops. But when the soil's soft, uh, when it's really wet, uh, especially flood irrigated rice, roots can penetrate that, but it holds water. So they've almost ar artificially created this impermeable layer. Uh, the soil's got virtually no structure, and... Um, one of my colleagues uh, early on, he took me around and I got to walk around in a rice field the first time and he would describe the consistency of the soil as being like cheesecake. <laughs> and that's always stuck with me. I mean, you could literally slice it. It was almost gelatinous. That's, the, that, that's what rice is grown in. So you've got this really extreme set of um, soil disturbance with, with tillage. Uh, and then they go and um, create little walls, levees around the field to hold the water. Uh, so it's like a, a little swimming pool. Uh, you know, they, they create this artificial wetland uh, to grow rice uh, and then um, let the rice uh, emerge four or five, six inches tall, four or five leaves on the little rice seedlings. And then, boom, uh, they put about four to six inches of water on it. Uh, and then, you know, that just the, the rice takes off from there. So, yeah, we've done some uh, uh, soil redox potential measurements under flood irrigated conditions in a silt loam soil. It takes about two weeks to uh, to go anaerobic and really get to the point where um, now methane is produced rather than CO2 uh, in the root zone. And so uh, thereafter, you know, it's it's carbon in the form of methane. So it is a little bit counterintuitive because we learn that really wet soil conditions slows down decomposition mm -hmm. of organic matter of the previous year's crop residue. So that's absolutely true. But then there really is this trade off because it's an environment. It's a management system that on the one hand is actually storing carbon, but then on the other hand, 
uh, it is perpetuating, it's stimulating uh, gaseous losses uh, and elevated gaseous losses in the form of methane. So there really is a balance uh, that is struck. I think on the whole, uh, rice production systems, flood irrigated rice particularly, is probably still a net carbon sink that rather than a net carbon source, but it still is a substantial carbon source that, you know, the EPA has identified. There are no other crops that are specifically identified, but right flood irrigated rice production is, is one of those management practices uh, that is uh, that the EPA has recognized specifically as a significant contributor, at least methane, to gas emissions in the atmosphere. So, you know, we do track uh, soil carbon storage over time uh, with depth, uh, certainly in the plow layer, uh, the upper part of the profile. And, and so, uh, but, but it's, it teeter totters, you know, sometimes if, if you actually have, you know, maybe a, a parcel of land that has been managed for a few decades in a rice soybean rotation. You know, rice produces a lot of biomass, uh, and then that gets returned to the soil. Uh, they try to burn rice residue. It doesn't burn really well because it actually has a high silica content, uh, but some of it does burn. Uh, but there's a, a large amount of organic matter that's returned year after year, well, after a rice crop. You throw soybeans in the mix half the time. Soybeans a low residue producer, uh, so there's not much that's returned in terms of carbon to the soil. So in a rice soybean rotation, uh, well, yeah, it could, it could teeter uh, the other way and, and turn out to be a net carbon source under that rotation. Maybe the continuous rice rotation goes back the other way and is a, is a net carbon sink, but it's a fine balance there. And then, of course, going to a totally different water management system, uh, this furrow irrigated sort of flush irrigated system they grow the rice there's raised beds and and water flushes down furrows well now you go back uh, the other way now you don't have that flood to go anaerobic and reduce decomposition carbon dioxide emissions go way back up immediately Um, methane not so much a little bit uh, but not so much but now you have nitrous oxide. What's going on with nitrogen from this very frequent yeah, back and forth, wet and dry, wet and dry, uh, many times over the course of the growing season, multiple times a week, in fact, uh, perfect storm uh, for N2O, just uh, exacerbating N2O emissions. Interestingly enough, when you've got a, a production scale, not really a research plot scale, we can't capture it at, at that you know, uh, 10 feet by 20 foot type of plot, but production scale, something that an actual producer, uh, they've got an entire field. Uh, furrow irrigated rice will will sort of uh, segregate into uh, different landscape positions that behave differently. The very downslope end of a furrow irrigated rice field very often will accumulate water over the season. And after not too long, it actually behaves as if it's under a flood. It, there's it's actually stays either really really wet to saturated or there's a little bit of ponded water so roughly a third of the field ends up behaving like flood irrigation then you got the mid slope and and the very uh, high end of the field the upslope position uh you know they've got these frequent wet dry cycles and uh the mid slope's a little bit wetter than the upslope and so it you've got this moisture gradient uh that uh uh, kind of exacerbates things as well. So it, it's really been fascinating. First of all, figure out how to measure greenhouse gas emissions under flood irrigated rice, uh, and and then moving to furrow irrigated rice uh, has has provided some more unique challenges. And, and I think uh, we've done quite a bit to extend our knowledge about uh, what to expect, uh, what's what are some mitigation practices to help minimize uh, furrow irrigated rice. You know, it's a trade-off. Uh, methane goes down, N2O goes up, but there are still some tweaks in the system that we can even minimize uh, N2O and CO2 emissions, uh, you know, maybe with reduced tillage practices, different types of uh, nutrient sources that, uh, you know, slow-release fertilizers uh, uh, help uh, the denitrification, you know, g- allow the plant to take up those nutrients more quickly rather than just boom, uh, 
be transferred through nitrification and goes wet and goes dry and, and then microbes denitrify and that nitrogen's gone, plant can't even get at it. So um, it's been, uh, been fascinating uh, to try to tease out some of these major effects uh, on, on both water management schemes uh, with rice production. Yeah, it's it's something you, you you mentioned a few times that that I think it's it's really it's really interesting to think about. It's just that there's always going to be these trade offs, right? It's it's very difficult to minim to maximize or maybe optimize all the metrics, right? Absolutely, all this variability, right? We ha as you were saying, you're going to have an effect of the previous crop of the tillage practice, even the rice cultivar. I mean, there's all these, the water management, nutrient management side of things, so many moving parts that growers are trying to incorporate into the, their decision making to some extent. And it's just really complex. It is, uh, you know, but this is these producers' livelihoods and it's not as easy for someone to say, oh, well, you know, just make it policy that uh, rice producers have to reduce gas emissions. Yeah, that's great. That would be ideal. It, it It's not that easy. And so there's a lot that we still don't know. There's a lot that we have learned. Uh, and it is very complex. Uh, lots of things are interacting. And, and that's not even bringing in the, the social, the, the economic uh, ends of things. That's just understanding uh, the science behind what's going on. Absolutely. So the conversation is being so fantastic, and I wish I had more time to ask you more follow-up questions on that side. But I do want to use some of our our episode um, to ask you about soil judging. So that is something you've been involved with, and I just really want to ask you if you could perhaps, you know, give a little bit of a background of what that is and how it works, um, and then some of your experiences with that. Absolutely. Uh, soil judging is something that uh, I got introduced to as an undergraduate as sort of an extracurricular activity, um, uh, sort of a fun uh, way to apply really a very useful field skills. Uh, you know, um, soils differentiate themselves into layers. Each of those layers have uh, different properties uh, that we can see. Uh, and, and differentiate from color. Uh, why is the soil black? Why is it brown? Why is it orange, red? Why is it gray? They all have meanings. Uh, and, and to learn about that is fascinating. Uh, one of the classes I didn't mention that I actually teach is a class in soil profile description. So that's, I, I teach my students what actual soil scientists do when they go out and do a uh, characterization of a soil profile, maybe to map it, uh, to classify it uh, for a variety of reasons uh, these days. But these are real skills. You know, there, there's only so much that you can do electronically with a smartphone these days. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure someone's trying, but uh, there's no replacement for being able to get your hands dirty, literally and, and figuratively, in a soil profile, uh, be able to identify soil structure, be able to identify uh, what the particle size distribution is, sand, silt, and clays, textural class, identify and, and label uh, horizons correctly. Uh, so uh, soil judging uh, is this manifestation of, first of all, learning, knowing how to do a soil profile description, and then making some uh, landscape interpretations, like what's the parent material? Uh, what landform is that soil on? Uh, would that soil be useful for particular uses? Uh, put a septic system in it, uh, build a home or use that soil for a basement or a foundation. What about building a road? All sorts of other soil uses we make interpretations about. So soil judging is this, uh, the very educational, uh, I dare say fun uh, activity where you do this in the context of a competition. So you have a team from a, an institution. Uh, there's typically regional contests in the fall of the year. Uh, the United States is broke up into about six or seven regions. Uh, the, the participating schools get together. 
uh, the uh, a school will host a contest and that rotates around. So uh, we actually get to travel and learn about soils of a different region. Uh, we practice for a few days and then we've got contest day. So it's uh, my group pitted up against uh, the other uh, teams that are in that region participating. There, there's sort of an individual component to it. Uh, and prizes, and then there's a, a, the team component to it, sort of as an overall. We also have a component where uh, instead of describing a soil profile individually, we have all of the school's participants put their heads together as a team and describe a soil profile. So uh, there, there's really a, a, some interesting aspects to the competition, but it's all centered around uh, being able to describe a profile, uh, label horizons, uh, identify some morphological characteristics with colors, uh, uh, horizon boundaries, uh, boundary distinctnesses, texture, structure, redoxomorphic features, uh, depending on the region might be uh, how much uh, a soil effervesces uh, in the presence of inorganic carbonates uh, in that profile. Then doing some taxonomy, doing some uh, classification, what's the epipedon, where the subsurface diagnostic horizons and features, uh, choose the soil order, the suborder, the great group, uh, make some interpretations about where that soil is in the landscape. Is it prone to runoff or water erosion? Uh, we measure the, the slope and make some interpretations about whether that soil would be suitable for a, a select uh, suite of, of uses. Uh, so uh, that's really been something that, that I experienced as an undergraduate. I went to one contest, got hooked, totally hooked. In graduate school, I helped coach uh, the, the team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. At the time, Fred Madison uh, was the uh, soil judging instructor and, and, and coach, and I learned a lot from him. He, he was an invaluable resource for me. Moving to Arkansas, uh, our soil judging team at the time uh, was coached by graduate students. So I stepped in and informalized this again. And then uh, I think I've missed one regional contest in 23 years, uh, strangely enough for uh, low interest uh, out of my students. Uh, but we got over the hump, uh, I don't know, about 15 years ago. And, and uh, my teams have been really competitive in the region. And uh, we're, we're starting to be more and more competitive at the national level. And this is really something that is a, a hands-on, tangible skill. And it is an absolute resume separator for students looking for jobs. That's the pitch that I give them. You, you might not actually like soils, but this is something that will give you a unique edge uh, when you're trying to compete and, and convince someone to hire you for a job, they don't have to train you. You come prepared uh, to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk uh, from a soil profile description standpoint. The fraternity of people that have done soil judging isn't that big. Coaches and former students, current students, every time soil judging is brought up, Whoever's done that knows exactly what that means and, and what those experiences have been like, uh, traveling, going to contests, practicing. And so it's an immediate connector with people. Uh, but then it's this um, marketing. Everybody's looking for that extra little edge. You know, jobs are competitive uh, these days. And, and this is something that, that uh, I believe I've seen it. I've been told by former students I mentioned the phrase soil judging, then the conversation changes differently in a positive way. Uh, oh, someone interviewing you. I did soil judging back uh, when I was a student. Uh, you know, we went to this place and that place and uh, we, we finished uh, uh, at, at this rank. Uh, so it, it really is a bonding thing and, and lasts forever for people. But um, my immediate pitch is, Heck, this is a, a separator on a resume. That's what you want to be able to do, make yourself unique compared to other people. And soil judging definitely does that. That's awesome. And, and it's I, I myself did not have that 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 opportunity going through college, but everyone that I that I met that that did do it, it's like it's very clear how much of an impact that experience has, not just in the technical side, but also as you're saying, like on other development of, or development of other skills 
um, that come along with that. So certainly, you know, you know, science is all about the power of observation, and you got to use your eyes, you use the tools that you've got, your hands. And all of that is integrated into to soil judging, soil profile description. So I think for those aspiring scientists, it, it really heightens those senses using your power of observation. You got to be able to identify colors and, and other features. And lots of soil judges go on to be professors. They go on to uh, do research. And, and a lot of that uh, beginning went back to hey, uh, you know, I learned how to watch and, and look at and use the, my senses uh, without even knowing that I wanted to do science. Uh, I'll learn that early on, uh, maybe with soil judging and some of those field skills. So Absolutely. It's time for our famous three. Explore the future of agriculture with KWS, a global leader in innovation and sustainable farming practices. Uncover the exceptional qualities of our hybrid rye, cultivating a legacy for a greener tomorrow. Visit kws.com forward slash us for more information and for dealer locations. KWS, seeding the future since 1856. Chris, we're getting towards the, the end of our episode. And with that, we have three questions more on the personal side um, to, to ask you. So the first one that I want to ask you here is if you have a favorite crop or soils or agronomy related book or movie or resource that you that you think it's it's it has it has done well for you to use that resource and if you like to share that with others. Well, this may I do have one in particular. Uh, I've got one that's obvious and, and one that's a little less obvious. I'll mention that, you know, uh, the Brady and Weil. Uh, nature and properties of soils uh, sort of textbook uh, I firmly believe is is the soil science bible uh, I've used that I've actually taught introductory soils for a couple of semesters I don't currently may need to in the future we'll see uh, but that was the textbook that I was introduced to as an undergraduate uh, I I've got like all of the recent versions on my de uh, on my bookshelf behind me, uh, and I go to that resource very frequently. Uh, I, I tell students, you know, you're preparing for comprehensive exams as a as a PhD student, or just to uh, review the literature uh, on on certain soils related topics. You go to Brady and Weil first, uh, get a good foundation, and, and that's such a uh, such a wonderful resource. Um, I use it. Uh, very frequently, uh, I always recommend that to other students. So uh, that'd be kind of the go-to one. And the, the the second one that I use very frequently, I had an opportunity about 12 years ago to create a Soils of Arkansas book. And that was a, just a phenomenal project. Uh, and and we completed it in uh, the fall of 2013. And, and so we've got a really uh, nice pictorial. That was sort of the uh, the goal was to get images of what as many different uh, soil series that are mapped within the state of Arkansas uh, represented in this book. We got pretty close to half, uh, which I thought was a, a really good uh, end point. Uh, but, uh, you know, soils are so visual uh, that we lose track of that. Uh, we walk on it. We, we it, It's often unseen, but uh, there's a lot of color. There's a lot of visual appeal to soils and uh, that was kind of the the devotion for uh, creating this book. Uh, so uh, I'll pass that out to all my students. I use it in classes. Uh, I get other people that ask for it uh, as a resource in Arkansas here and beyond. Uh, people in other states are contemplating doing something for their state. And uh, I'm proud that uh, people look to ours as an example. So maybe that's two to answer that one question. No, that's fantastic. And that's, that's two really great resources. So I'm glad that you shared that with our audience. All right. So our second question here is, what would be a similar resource that you have enjoyed using in the past, but outside of crop or soils or agriculture? Oh, man, uh, that is a lot tougher question because uh, uh, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't I don't read a whole lot for re recreation. Uh, I do a lot of reading of, of scientific writing of students. Uh, my graduate students, I make most of my class undergraduate students write. So th that's a lot of the, the reading uh, that I do. But uh, maybe I'll give 
more of a, a recommendation and, and piece of an advice for aspiring scientists that, that have to do like scientific writing, find a good resource or find an author that you know is a good scientific writer and read their work and try to absorb uh, as much as you can uh, because the scientific literature uh, just because it's published doesn't mean it's actually good writing. And that's a, a lesson that I learned in graduate school uh, and I passed that along. So that's not a specific uh, outside of crop soil, but that's um, discipline, but that's a, more of a general piece of advice is go find an author that either that someone else has told you is a good writer uh, and absorb what you can from their skill and, and their language and uh, their manipulation of uh, of words and, and getting points across. Uh, so for budding scientists, that's that would be a really valuable place. You know, find a resource that you can learn about uh, scientific writing because uh, you're not going to be able to shy away from it. Yeah, absolutely, that that's that's fantastic. And and as you were saying it, I I could totally relate to that. I remember going from grad school and. And identifying a couple of authors or researchers that I was like, I love their style. They it flows so well. It's I'm excited about reading their paper. It's not confusing, and not everyone has that skill. So it, absolutely, I totally agree that finding your your examples out there and, and kind of absorbing from that it's really it's really helpful. Awesome. So my last question here is, and maybe you already talked about this to some extent, but in your opinion, what sets successful crop professionals apart from those that are not successful or maybe not as successful? Well, I, I, I think being able to uh, be credible uh, with your audience, uh, whether that's other scientists, whether that's lay people, y you've got to have tangible uh, experiences. Uh, if you're talking about how a crop might respond uh, in the field to a certain management practice or how a soil will respond, y you really need to have some background uh, that would demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. So uh, I always tell students and, and when I bring on new graduate students, I'm going to try to get you s as wide a range of experiences as possible because you never know when those little things might be helpful later on. It's like, oh yeah, I did that once. Well, that gives you some credibility. You know, setting yourself apart. Uh, we talked about the soil judging with maybe undergraduates and uh, and being able to have a unique separator uh, feature of your resume. Getting those experiences. Don't be afraid to try something new. Uh, you might like it, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you don't like it, you didn't spend a whole lot of time at it, but you've got those experiences. Just uh, avoid being a hermit. Uh, someone enclosed in your office never gets out into the field. Uh, you know, we do grow crops. We do do research in the lab, uh, in the greenhouse, but most of it happens outside. So don't be afraid to go outside. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that, that's good advice. Awesome. Chris, it was an absolute honor and great time having you here with us today for this episode. I really appreciate it. All, all the thoughts and experiences you shared with us, and I'm sure our audience will just as well. So thank you for, for being here today, and it was great having you. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. This was great.